Bibles, Luke chapter 9. Uh, so many stories in this one, so many themes in this chapter. I was struggling to find a, a, a title for the sermon this morning. But I did like one verse in particular, Luke chapter 9, verse 20. Have a look at that. Luke chapter 9, verse 20. He said unto them, but, uh, sorry, but whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, the Christ of God. So I like the question that Jesus asked there. The title of the sermon this morning is, whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? Verse number one, Luke chapter nine, verse one. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. So we see now here that Jesus Christ is giving his disciples, his 12 disciples, his 12 apostles. This would include Judas Iscariot. All right, even the betrayer was given the power by Jesus Christ to have authority and be able to cast out devils and cure diseases. You know, leading up to this point, we've seen Jesus Christ doing the amazing miracles, healing the sick, etc. Now he's given his apostles, his disciples, the 12, this power. And verse number two, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, before we keep reading, I want to put this to bed once and for all. Okay, I'm tired of hearing preaching of people that say, hey, if you're preaching the kingdom of God here in this time, in Jesus' time with his apostles, when they'll preach in the kingdom of God, what a lot of preachers will say to you, they'll preach in the millennium, that Christ would establish the millennium, that he was here, the king of the Jews, and should they accept him, he would set up the, you know, the, the kingdom of God on this earth right now. Okay, and the reason they hold to this uh, teaching is because of an a, of a, of a interpretive tool, a man-made interpretive tool called dispensationalism. And what they like to say is that there's, there's a difference between being of Jewish blood, of having Jewish DNA, than there is of being Gentile. And so quite often when they say, well, see, they, they're preaching the kingdom of God here. They're preaching that Christ is going to establish the millennium kingdom right now, should they accept him as king. But we see in this passage, that's not what it's about. Okay, now the, the millennium kingdom is part of the kingdom of God. I'll, go, I'll cover that shortly. But so let's keep reading. Verse number three. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. All right, so. Actually, drop down to verse number six for a minute. Drop down to verse number six. We'll come back to it. But look at this. And they departed. So what did Christ ask them to do? To preach the kingdom of God. And then verse number six. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel. Amen. All right, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. That's what Christ asked them to do, right? To preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What do they do in verse six? They preach the gospel and heal everywhere. All right, so let's put this to bed once and for all. What, when Christ has asked them to preach the kingdom of God, when Christ went preaching uh, the kingdom of God, he was preaching the gospel. He was preaching <laughs> salvation, all right? The same salvation that's for the Jews and for the Gentiles, okay? So please, when you read your Bible, it's not complicated. Unless you take the position that, well, the disciples here, they've been disobedient. Instead of preaching the kingdom of God, well, they're preaching the gospel. How dare they? No. Okay. Obviously, they obeyed Christ. And the Bible here gives us uh, the correlation there. It gives us the understanding of what it means to preach the kingdom of God. It means to preach the gospel. Hey, when we go out uh, two by two, knocking doors of this community, we preach the gospel, but we're also preaching the kingdom of God. I'll cover that in a minute, a minute uh, 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 shortly. Okay. But look at verse number three again. Jesus told him to take nothing. They were to take nothing with them, not, not food, nor money, nor have an extra coat in case it gets cold, uh, neither staff, nor script. A script is like a, like a backpack, you know, full of, full of things that you might need on your journey. And whatsoever house you enter into, there abide, and thence depart. So Jesus is expecting as they go from city to city, as they go from house to house, that people would receive them. Maybe people that are already saved, or people that hear the gospel and believe, you know, they would receive these, these uh, apostles and provide for them. All right, so the thought is, well, hold on then. You know, sh should that be what we do? Should we just, you know, quit our jobs? 
You know, should we just, you know, go and expect God, you know, just go preach the gospel and expect God to provide, you know, every way possible. Keep your finger there. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 35. Luke chapter 22, verse 35. Luke 22, verse 35. So this is obviously later in, in the ministry of Christ. But look what he says to his disciples here. Luke 22, verse 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. That's good, right? Jesus because he commands them here to do it. Just go, you know, don't take, you don't need anything else with you. And they said, we had lack of nothing. Everything we needed was provided for in our journey. But look at verse 36. And then said, sorry, then said he unto them, but now he that have a purse, let him take it. So if you have money, take your money. And likewise his scripts, like likewise the things that you need. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. And you, you don't even need a sword to go and preach the gospel. You need to defend yourself because there are people that would come and attack you. But I just want to show you there. Now, I don't have all the answers on this, okay? But I just want to show you that there was a definite change. You know, earlier in the ministry of Christ when he sent them, that there'd be a supernatural productivity and, uh, you know, uh, providence for his disciples. You know, Jesus Christ on the earth with the power that he had given them to heal you know, uh, the sick and to cast out devils, that they would be provided for. But now, as, this is shortly before Christ would be crucified. You know, toward the end of his ministry, he says, look, now there's a change. Now you need to take the things that you need with you and make sure that you're providing for yourself. Okay? So uh, the reason I just point that out to you is not because I really have a solid answer for this. Obviously, it has something to do with Christ being on this earth and then being crucified and ascending into heaven. Some sort of change takes place there. But I, I don't want you to read Luke chapter 9 and think, man, I can just quit my job and go soul winning and I'll be fine. I'll be provided for, my family will be provided for. No, there was certain instructions that were required just for that ministry, that three-year ministry of Christ. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to verse number 4. Luke chapter 9, verse 4. Luke chapter 9, verse 4. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. Actually, I just did want to read one little quick passage to you. Because as I was reading through this, I was reminded of the Apostle Paul and how we've gone through uh, the book of Corinthians. And just quickly read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, speak, Paul speaking of himself, he goes, Even unto, unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. I just wanted to bring that to your attention just so you can see that transition that took place. You know, in the time of Paul's ministry, you know, there were times that he went without. We know this. We covered this in depth before, right? He had no food. He had, you know, uh, his clothing was wearing out. He didn't have a place to rest his head. And so we definitely see that transition take place. But we also know that the Apostle Paul would provide for himself. He was also, he had a, he had a job. He was a tent maker. And he'd make sure he'd provide for himself. Or certain churches that he, he went to would provide for him as well. All right, so uh, verse number five, verse number five, Luke chapter nine, verse five. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. Okay, and uh, this, is the, this is good instruction for us as soul winners. All right, because we're going door to door. There's literally thousands of houses to knock. All right, and we need to make sure that we don't get offended when people don't receive us. We make sure we don't get offended when people don't want to hear the gospel. They might even say nasty things to you. They may not receive you. What's the instruction from Jesus Christ? Just move on. Move on. Go to where people will be ready to receive you. Okay? Someone's saying, look, I don't want to hear it. You don't need to keep driving home. Or like, give me a moment to give you the gospel. They don't want to hear it. Just move on. Okay? That's the instruction that Jesus Christ gave you. You know, for two reasons. Number one, you'll get discouraged. You know, if you, if you try to continue the conversation with someone that doesn't want to hear you, you'll get discouraged. You'll be thinking, why doesn't someone want to receive me? Don't worry about it. Just move on. But number two, you're wasting your time. Okay? The way I like to think about it when I go soul winning is when someone doesn't want to receive me, it just means there's someone further down the road that wants to hear the gospel. There's someone further down the road that might be ready to receive the gospel and be saved. That's the, that's the way we ought to look at it. So thank you, God. I'm not wasting my time at this door. I'm moving on to the next one. Okay? Verse number six, and they departed, and we, we this, I talked about this already, and went through the towns preaching the gospel 
and healing everywhere. So we see that preaching the kingdom of God is preaching the gospel. All right. Now, just very quickly, Galatians 1.8. Galatians 1.8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. All right, so the reason I want to quote that to you is because there's this teaching, and once again, well, there's many gospels, you know? They were preaching one gospel, you know, the millennium kingdom was about to come or whatever, and we preach another gospel of Jesus Christ, believing on him in faith. No, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. There's one gospel and one gospel alone. All right? Now, that's hard. That's a tough pill for some people to swallow. I mean, just um, Thursday, Matt and I went soul winning. Was it Thursday? Friday. Friday, we went soul winning, right? And the first door that we knocked at, the guy was really receptive. He understood the gospel, but he struggled to believe that someone that believed another gospel or had another way to God would be damned in hell. It's, look, it's one gospel. It's salvation by grace through faith without works. Okay, it's eternal life today and it can never be lost. It's once saved, always saved. There's one gospel. All right. So as we see these people going out and preaching the gospel, what are they preaching? Faith on Christ. Okay, salvation by grace through faith without the deeds of the law. Verse number seven. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. And by the way, do you guys know who this Herod is? Herod the Tetrarch? It's the same Herod that uh, beheaded John the Baptist. And it's, it's the son of Herod the Great. You know, if you don't know who that is, Herod the Great was Herod who uh, attempted to kill Jesus Christ when he was born. Remember when he, he ordered that all babies from two years old and under would be uh, killed? That's Herod the Great. Um, that's his father. And Herod the Tetrarch is his son. Okay? who had beheaded uh, John the Baptist. But anyway, now uh, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because because it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. So some were saying to Herod, hey, John's come back, you beheaded him, but now he's, look, why, why are they confused? It's because what Jesus Christ is preaching is the same thing that John the Baptist was preaching, okay? Jesus, John the Baptist was preaching the same thing, and they were very similar in style of preaching, I assume, right? That, that the fact that Jesus Christ would remind him of John the Baptist. In fact, when you look at the preaching of John the Baptist in the Bible, and you, if you just read what he preached, you might be easily you know, mistaken of thinking that those were words of Jesus Christ, or vice versa, because they're preaching the same thing. All right, verse number eight. And of some that Elias had, had, had appeared... And of others, uh, that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. I like his desire. I, I do like his desire. And even, even when he arrested John the Baptist for preaching against him, he was saddened that he would have to put this man to death because of the promise that he made uh, to his uh, niece. So there was something about Herod the Tetrarch that enjoyed listening to men of God. Okay, but he just wouldn't accept, basically accept it. You know, he would, he would be more willing to, you know, I guess, put them to death. But, um, you know, you see this in verse 9, that he desired to see Jesus. And unfortunately for him, he did see Jesus. So I'll just quickly show you. You can actually turn there if you want. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, just because you're in the same book. Luke chapter 23, verse 8. He does eventually see Jesus, but this is after Jesus Christ was arrested and on his way to be crucified, basically, okay? But Luke chapter 23, verse 8, it says, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him for a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So we see that the reason why he was interested in Jesus is that he wanted to be entertained. (laughs) He wanted to see uh, Jesus Christ perform these miracles and see that with his own eyes. And so, you know, I, I don't know what to make of him too much, um, but, you know, it, it's kind of nice, I guess, that he had some interest in the prophets of God, that he had some interest in John the Baptist and Jesus Christ himself. But um, obviously, I just wanted to show you there that that's when he saw him, was when he, uh, and Jesus Christ ended up being crucified. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. 
Actually, before I read verse 10, I just want you to notice that as Jesus Christ was doing the great works of God, that a lot of people were asking, who is this man? You know, is he Elias? Is he a prophet? John the Baptist come back from the dead? And this is a question that every single human being on the planet has to answer. Okay, hence the title of the sermon this morning. Okay, we all have to make a decision on who Jesus Christ is. Everybody. You know, everybody needs to make that decision. Everybody that walks this earth. We'll cover that a little later. Verse number 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. So obviously some time takes place. They've gone from city to city. They come back and they tell Jesus Christ of what had done, what they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. So some significant time takes place there. But verse 11, And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them the kingdom of God. So what's Jesus speaking unto them? He's preaching the gospel. He's speaking to them the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge, so find a place to rest and get victuals. That's basically food for themselves, nourishment. For we are here in a desert place. So it seems like the, the disciples are well mean. They do care for the multitude. They do care, hey, look, we're in the desert. These guys are going to burn out. We're going to go hungry. Uh, they don't have a place to rest. You know, send them away, they say. You know, but as we'll see in this story, the reason that they want to send away these, this multitude is really it was a lack of faith. It was a lack of faith on the part of the disciples, which is kind of interesting because not long ago, Jesus Christ gave them the power to heal the sick and, and to cast out devils and told them, you're going to be provided for. Don't worry about it. You know, so it's, it's interesting that they realized they were provided for, but yet when they saw this multitude of 5,000 men, they thought, well, these people aren't going to be provided for. All right? Send them away. Verse 14. And they were about 5,000 men. And I just want you to notice that it's 5,000 men. That doesn't count the women and children. There could have easily been 10,000 people here. We don't know. Okay? But easily could have been 10,000 people if you count the women and the children. But here there was about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so and made them all sit down. And I, and I love the, how Jesus Christ is just, an, just orderly. You know, he's got this great mass of people, hungry, you know, but he likes order. And he says, look, sit them down uh, by fifties in a company. So, uh, you know, that's 5,000 men. And that would be groups of 100. You know, if you had groups of 50, sorry, yeah, groups of 50, you would have 100 groups of men, you know, uh, broken up. And then verse 16. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. Now, it's not recorded here in the book of Luke, but if you know in the other Gospels, or I think it's the Gospel of Matthew, it mentions the little boy, the young lad, who, had, who offered up his lunch to feed the multitude. It's not covered here, but anyway. He took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat, and were all filled and there was taken up of fragments that remained to them 12 baskets. So we see another miracle of Christ. His amazing provision. Not just the provision to the disciples as they went out preaching the gospel, but the provision to those that would sit and listen to Jesus Christ. Those that were in the desert. And I think it's really significant. I mean, the Bible doesn't really tell us this, but I think it's quite significant in verse number 17 that after everyone was fed and filled, there were still 12 baskets left full of food. Right, taking up of fragments that remained of them, 12 baskets. And I, I kind of think about that because there were 12 disciples. And it was the disciples that were telling Jesus, look, send them away. And it's, it's almost like Jesus Christ is teaching them, look, not only can I provide, but I can uh, provide abundantly, you know, in excess of what is needed. And it's almost like each disciple was left with one basket each, just to remind themselves, you know, to have faith in Christ, that Christ can provide. Verse number 18. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say uh, that one of the old prophets is risen again. So, okay, yeah, what are other people saying? 
But then verse number 20, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? But whom say ye that I am? You know, and this is a question for all of us. You know, there are a lot of people that believe in Jesus or a Jesus or another Jesus, you know, and they have many things to say about him. You know, even people that respect Jesus Christ, but a lot of people would see him as just a man, as just a good prophet, not as the Son of God, not as Christ, not as God manifest in the flesh, not as the one that can save you from your sins. They might say, yeah, he's got great teaching, he's a great prophet, he's a great man, you know. Or they might have that oneness Jesus that we've been hearing about, right? You know, having a oneness view on who Jesus Christ is, that, you know, there's no difference necessarily between the Father and the Holy Spirit. That would be another Jesus. Hey, look, if, if we just stopped and listened to what people are saying about Jesus, there's various things. You know, you ask the Jews about Jesus, they believe he was a wicked man, a rebellious man who rebelled against, you know, uh, the laws of, of Moses. You know, they hate him. There are lots of views on Jesus. You ask the, uh, the, 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 the Muslims, who's Jesus? I say, was a, he was a good prophet, but the greater prophet was Muhammad, they'll say. Their prophet, Muhammad, okay? Lots of people have different opinions on who Jesus Christ was. Some people believe that he didn't even exist, that he's not even a historical figure. Whatever. More important than what others are saying there in verse number, uh, what verse was it, sorry? Verse, sorry? Verse number 20. Yeah, more important than that. More important than what others are saying. But whom say ye that I am? Okay? And I just want to bring this to the children's attention. Mum and dad have their view on Jesus. You know, I hope you all have saved parents, you know, that have believed, have put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, mum and dad believe in Jesus. Yeah, but whom say ye that I am? Hey, every child has to answer this for themselves. Everybody must make a decision on who Jesus Christ is. Peter answering, verse 20, Peter answering said, the Christ of God. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're the anointed. All right. We've been hearing about you through the scriptures, through the Old Testament. We've been hearing from other prophets. This is who you are. And Peter was 100% correct. Verse 21, and he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Okay, so everybody has to come to that realization on their own. Who is Jesus Christ? Was he the promised one of God? Is he the one that came to take away the sins of the world? Verse number 22. Saying, oh, actually, verse 22 um, explains verse 21 a little bit more. It goes, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Did Jesus know that he was going to die? Absolutely. Now that was his mission. He came to the earth to be that sacrifice, to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? And we see there that, hey, this is what he came to accomplish. This is what the Christ of God came to do. And everybody has to come and realize that. Everybody must come to realize that he would come and die for their sins. But this is the first time in the book of Luke that it's recorded that Jesus Christ would speak of his death. Okay? It didn't come as a surprise. His death was not plan B. Okay? And again, I just, I'm, the reason I say it's not plan B, because those that have a dispensational view of scriptures will say his crucifixion was plan B. You know, plan A was he was offering the kingdom on the earth for the Jews right now. And they rejected him, so he had to go with plan B and die on the cross instead and postpone the kingdom. The kingdom, let me say this, the kingdom was not postponed. The kingdom is here now. And I'll, I'll cover that in, shortly, okay? The kingdom was not postponed. It's here now. We'll cover that in a minute. Verse 23. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Is this the gospel? Is Jesus Christ telling, explaining the gospel right now? That you need to take up your cross daily. Every day you need to take up your cross and live for Him and serve Him and follow Him. Is that the gospel? No. The gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? But the instructions that are being given here are to those that are already saved, those that are choosing to be His disciples and following after Him. I don't want to steal uh, Brother Callum's thunder here because I know your next sermon is on discipleship, but I'll touch on it briefly, okay? 
And, uh, and then verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. All right, so we see here that during this three year ministry, Jesus Christ had his disciples. We had men that would forsake all things, that would forsake family, forsake their full time jobs, and come and follow after Christ. Okay, it was during this three year ministry of Christ that this was available. But we can take the applications as well to us. Okay, we can take these applications. And basically, what it's saying here is that, you know, if you were to lose things today for Christ's sake, if you were to lose relationships, families would hate you. You know, just for standing up for the word of God, just for preaching the gospel, then you would gain that into life eternal. Okay, whatever you lose in this life for Christ, He will reward you. He will make sure you're going to be thankful that you were able to lose things for His sake. Okay, but if you try to gain this whole world, if you live for temporal things, okay, and obviously if you do that, you won't be able to live for Christ as much as you'll be able to, then those are rewards that you would not gain in heaven. Those are rewards that you would not lose. Okay? Essentially, the teaching here is whatever you give up for Christ, it'll be worth it. Christ will make sure that you're rewarded adequately uh, and a hundredfold. Okay? Verse number 27. But I tell you a truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Wow. Okay? Now, I told you the kingdom is here already. All right. There's a lot of sort of discussion as to what this means. OK, and, um, and I've already covered this, but I'm just going to cover uh, this teaching in a, in a quick nutshell. But I have taught this uh, last year, if you guys remember. But keep your finger there. Turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I don't want to cover it too much because when we get to the 13th chapter, we're going to look at this a little in more detail. But Luke chapter 13, verse 20. Luke chapter 13, verse 20. Jesus speaking here, he says, And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? So how, how can I liken the kingdom of God? Verse 21, It is like leaven. Okay, now what's leaven? It's basically like a yeast. Okay, it uh, uh, lifts up. If you put it into bread, it's going to cause it to rise and be fluffy and soft. Okay, so the kingdom of God is like leaven. And then it says this, Which a woman took, and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. So what we see there, and this is a parable about the kingdom of God, is that there are, what I believe, three stages to the kingdom of God. Okay, A lot of people discuss this and they don't really understand. This is why there are you know, our millennialists and pre-millennialists, and, but we're pre-millennialists and there's uh, post-millennialists and there's... Uh, I think there's one other one. I can't remember right now what it is, okay? But there's all these people that have different views on the kingdom. And so when Jesus Christ said that there are some standing here that will see the kingdom of God, there are some that basically uh, deny the future millennial reign of Christ, and they say, well, the, the millennium is here. The kingdom of God is here. And there's truth to that, okay? But there's still the future millennium to come as well, okay? So we see the kingdom of God is like leaven in three measures of meal until the whole is leavened the whole is uh, uh, raised what was the word you used there sorry yeah until the whole was leavened okay so what we see and i'll cover this very quickly and if you want to ask me more questions you can later on but from what i understand in scriptures when we look at the kingdom of god we look at all the passages that talk about it the kingdom of god is in three stages it's here today but it's not something that can be seen today Okay, when we win people to the Lord, when they're saved, they enter into the kingdom of God, spiritually speaking. Okay, the kingdom of God is here in a spiritual sense. Remember the, 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 um, the, the, the mustard seed, something that cannot be seen, but then it grows into that tree and, and the birds uh, make the nest in, the, in its branches. It's another parable that Jesus Christ gave of the kingdom of God. Okay, right now it's like that mustard seed that cannot be seen. But it's here today. People can enter into the kingdom of God today. Okay, but it's not been fully leavened. Okay? Then we get to that second measure of meal, if you will. Okay, when Christ comes back and establishes his millennial kingdom. 
At that point, you'll be able to see the kingdom of God. You know, and he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. You know, but even then, the kingdom has not been fully leavened. Okay, because what we read about in the scriptures is that once that millennium is over and everything is been, has been subjected under Christ, that Christ gives that kingdom to the Father and the Father creates the new heaven and the new earth. That's like that third measure of meal. And now the entire kingdom of God has been fully leavened. Okay, so the reason I say that to you is because I believe the kingdom of God is here now. It's available right now. Okay, it's not something we have to wait for. It's here, spiritually speaking. But then in time, in due time, we'll see it come uh, in full fruition, starting by that millennial reign of Christ and then the new heavens and the new earth when the Father takes the kingdom from the Son. All right, let's uh, look at verse 28. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Verse 28. So I'm going to explain to you verse 27 in just a moment here. So he said, remember, there are some standing here that shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So it's something that's going to be visible to them. It's going to be something that they see. Some of his disciples there standing before him. Verse 28. And this is where I believe they see the kingdom of God. Verse 28. And it came to pass about an eighth days after these sayings. So about a week later, he took Peter and John and James and went into a mountain to pray. So it's Peter, John and James that will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. As we read through this. Verse 29. And as he prayed... The fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. So Jesus has this transformation, okay? It doesn't look just like a normal man anymore. There's something that changes, his countenance changes. He's white, he's bright, he's shining. In verse 30, and behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. That's Elijah, okay? The two men, two great prophets of God standing there. They are in the kingdom of God, as it will. Okay, and they're able to talk to Jesus Christ. You know, they're alive. You know, they're alive. <laughs> you know, when we pass away, guys, we're still alive. <laughs> okay, we're in the kingdom of God and we'll be able to communicate, you know, with other people that have gone before and with the Lord God Himself. Verse 31 Who appeared in glory and spake of His de uh, decease, which uh, sh He should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter, when they were sorry, but Peter and they that were with him were heavy and sorry, were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles: one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias not knowing what he said. Okay, so it's interesting there in verse 33. You know, Peter speaks up, and we know Peter, we know what he's like. He's the kind of guy that would speak before he thinks. All right? You know, he's one of those disciples, and, you know, it serves him well in some cases, and then in some cases it kind of embarrasses him, okay? But um, he says, look, he sees Jesus, he sees Moses and Elijah, he says, look, let, let, me, let us build you three tabernacles. Like, what an odd thing to say. <laughs> like, what an odd th So the tabernacle, if you know, obviously from the Old Testament, was the place where they would, uh, you know, ultimately build an altar and, and sacrifice animals, a place where people would come and enter and worship God, okay? So think about that. Yeah, it might be relevant to some extent if you talk about Jesus Christ, but then to build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah as well, like, like sacrificing to them and worshiping them, you know, and that's why it says there at the end of verse 33, not knowing what he said. Moses doesn't even know, I mean, Peter doesn't even know what he's saying, I mean, he's so shocked. He's so amazed. He's marveling at what he sees, the glory of Christ, this transformation, you know, beyond just uh, God in the flesh, but now seeing some of that glory of God and being affrighted, he just speaks, you know, he's the kind of guy and he just says the wrong words. He just doesn't know what he's saying. Essentially is what the Bible says, all right? They were amazed. And then verse 34, this is probably one of the most interesting bits. Uh, While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And... Uh, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. What an amazing thing. They hear the voice of God the Father. And it's interesting, before God the Father speaks to him, he puts him in this cloud. All right? It's because, you know, no man has seen the Father. Okay? We can see Christ, 
You know, Christ came and is that express image of the Father, but no man has truly seen God the Father. It's almost like the Father protects them, puts them in this cloud, you know, makes it foggy and difficult to see, and all they hear is the voice of God the Father. And they've entered somehow spiritually during this transformation of Christ, and they've seen the kingdom of God. They can even hear God the Father speaking. You know, and they see Jesus, they see, you know, uh, uh, prophets that had, you know, been long dead, but now, hey, they're, they're just as alive as, as anything, all right? And it's just, just an amazing thing, this transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Verse 36, And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close, and told no man in those days um, any of those things which they had seen. And but what did they see? They saw the kingdom of God. That's what they saw. Beyond the spiritual realm, you know, I mean, sorry, beyond the physical realm, they saw the spiritual kingdom of God there, okay? Verse 37, And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met them. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only child. And lo, a spirit take of take him. And he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, and um, that he foameth again. So that word terrorism him is like that this, this evil spirit to his son is kind of like torturing him. And, and it, to, like that is foaming out of his mouth, that is foaming again. And bruising him hard, hardly departeth, uh, sorry, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Now it's interesting what Jesus says here in verse uh, number 40, 41. I used to think, until I did a, some uh, research and compared the, the, the different Gospels, I used to think verse 41 was Jesus um, criticizing his disciples because his disciples could not cast out this devil. Okay? But as I read through it and I meditated on it, I realized that what, who Jesus Christ is referring to is the father of the son who had the devil. Okay? Because look at this. He says in verse 41, Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, Okay, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. Okay, so in light of this, as I was thinking about it, why does Jesus Christ call him and others, you know, uh, faithless and a perverse generation? And what I believe it's saying here is because it's not like he just came saying, hey, you know, your disciples couldn't do it. I believe this man was actually being critical of the disciples of Jesus Christ, that they were failing at the job that they had and because of that critical nature to the disciples of God, Jesus says, hey, look, it's not just the disciples here. It's you. You are a faithless and perverse generation. Okay? So when it comes to the healing, and we've seen this as we've gone through the book of Luke, the reason Christ heals many is because he says, I've seen your faith. You know, I saw your faith, and he heals them. In this case, his son could not be delivered partly because his own father was faithless. His own father was, was not believing. And then he's critical of the disciples, critical of the workers of God. Now, it's interesting to me that uh, the book of Luke does not record uh, the conversation later on because the disciples actually do go to Jesus and say, how, how come we couldn't cast out this devil? And we'll cover that in a minute, okay? We'll cover that in a minute. Uh, but then verse 42, it says, And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. So again, he's foaming at his mouth. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Okay, so keep your finger there and turn to Matthew 17. Turn to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 19. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, verse 19. So I want to look at the, the rest of the story. Okay, the rest of the story, because Luke doesn't talk about it there. Matthew 17, verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? So they come to Jesus. And another uh, uh, gospel says they went into a house. Okay? So this was a private conversation. Verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you, howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And uh, so what we see there, guys, and I, I like this about Jesus. As, as I'm reading this and I'm really focusing on what's happening, 
is I like how when there's the, the multitudes, okay, and there was a failure at casting out this devil, that Jesus Christ does not criticize his disciples, does not criticize his apostles in public. He doesn't just get before the whole public and say, well, you know, you guys had a lack of faith as well. No, in instead, he rebukes the faithless and perverse generation. He says, hey, you play a part in this. You're playing a part that this boy was not, uh, has not been healed from, from this uh, evil spirit. But then when the disciples ask him privately, apart, you know, away from that group, he tells them, hey, yeah, you had a lack of faith as well. Okay? But I, I like that. I like how Jesus Christ does that. You know, he doesn't try to embarrass his workers publicly in front of everybody, but he still deals with it. He still deals with the situation, pulls them aside privately, and, 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 uh, and addresses that. And I, I like that. You know, as, as I learn about being a pastor and, you know, different situations that I'm dealing with, I like seeing how Jesus Christ does things and go, you know what, that's probably the best way to do it, right? You know, if there's an issue in the church and, you know, there's something that I need to raise with you, you know, instead of me just coming behind the pulpit and naming your name and, and embarrass you publicly, I'd rather do what Jesus Christ has done, pull you aside privately and speak to you and say, hey, this is an issue, because that, that's what Jesus did. I think, it's, I think it's a really good example to follow, okay? Instead of embarrassing him in front of everybody, all right? But notice that it wasn't just a faith. But he said, look, you guys actually needed to pray and fast about this one as well. And it's, it's an interesting thing. I don't really fully understand this. But it seems like some evil spirits, some devils, are more powerful than others. Okay? And you need that extra prayer and fasting to cast them out. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. So this is after he cast out that devil. And while they wondered, every one of... Uh, Everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. So again, he's prophesying about him being betrayed, being delivered into the hands of men, which he spoke of earlier being his death and, and uh, resurrection. All right? But as I got thinking about this, it seems like just because of the way it's written like that, you know, everyone's amazed, right? In verse 43, everyone's amazed that Jesus was able to do this miracle. And then it says, um, he's, at, while they're amazed, he says to the disciples, let these saints sink down, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And I think it, this is, when, when you start thinking about the context, and remember, the book of Luke is a thematic book. You know, it's a topical kind of book, all right? And I think what we're seeing here is that there are certain people that saw the miracles of Christ, they were amazed at the miracles of Christ, but we saw they were also a faithless and perverse generation. And it's that some of these same people would be the ones that would deliver Christ. The same people that would be betraying Him. The same people that would be rebuking Him uh, when He was on the cross and denying Him. Okay, so, you know, you know sometimes that we go, so, I don't know if you've had this occasion, I've gone soul winning, and people said, you know, I would believe on Christ if I just saw Him do a miracle. Like if Jesus Christ appeared right now in front of me, you know, then I believe. You know, that's when I believe on Jesus Christ. You know, that's a faithless and perverse generation. You know, even these people that saw the miracles of Christ still rejected Him. Many of them still rejected Him. Okay? Anyway, verse 46. Verse 46. Oh, sorry, verse 45. And they understood not the same. So when Jesus Christ says, look, I'm going to be delivered in the hands of men, and earlier told him that he's going to be put to death, they could not understand it. All right? And they stood not the same, and it was hid from them. And they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him, to ask him of that saying. Just an interesting thought there. Verse 46. And there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? <laughs> so instead of trying to figure out, what does Jesus mean that he's going to be delivered, you know, and be killed and all this stuff? They're more concerned about talking, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? You know, who's going to be the one that Jesus Christ exalts above all the other disciples? It's just, that's how man is sometimes, you know. Um, verse 47, And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him, by, set him by him. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. Who's that? That's the Father. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. What a rebuke. <laughs> they go, man, who's going to be the greatest? And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're thinking that because they're spending all this time with Jesus Christ. 
They themselves are doing these amazing works of God. You know, they're, they're, they're rubbing shoulders with the Christ of God. It's an exciting time for them. And then look how good, close we are to Jesus. We're following after him with his disciples. You know, we're learning so many great things. Surely we're going to be the greatest. And I love what Jesus does. And this shows us, by the way, that when Jesus went preaching, the kids weren't away in Sunday school. All right? The kids were right there because Jesus can just take a child and set them before them. All right? Jesus was preaching to the children as much as to everyone else that was there listening to them. Okay? And that's why we don't have Sunday school. That's why we have the children sit in and listen to the preaching from the Word of God. But he says, look, in verse 48, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. Essentially, it's like this. Because you and I, we can't walk with Jesus, can we? We can't rub shoulders with Jesus like the disciples did. Okay? But he says, look, more important than that, <laughs> all right, more important than you being with me and thinking that you're the greatest, and I'm sure many of them were great, okay, is you receiving the least people, you receiving the little child in my name, okay? And I was just thinking about this in context of our church. You know, we have little children, we have little babes in our church, okay? And if we choose to ignore the children, you know, I'm just here for the adult stimulation, for the adult discussions, you know, and you don't think about what good influence, what a great blessing you can be to children, then that shows me how great you are in the kingdom of, of God. In fact, that's not very great at all, okay? But the one that does say, you know what, I'm going to spend some time, I'm going to spend some time and talk to the children, I'm going to encourage them, I'm going to say to them, hey, have you memorized the verse? You know, how's your Bible reading? Encourage them, those kinds of things. Spend time with them, spend time with the least, you receive the child in the name of Jesus, then he says, you receive me. You receive him, you know, Jesus Christ. And if you receive me, you're receiving the one that sent me. That's God the Father. You want to be great? You want to be the one hanging around with God the Father. How do you do that? You receive the little child. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, it requires us to be humble, you know, to humble ourselves and go, you know what, I'm going to find the least person in the church, the one with the least reputation, the one with the least stature, not just a little child, obviously that's symbolic, but maybe the babe in Christ, the one that hasn't been saved for very long. Maybe the one that's, you know, new to our church and, you know, doesn't know all the doctrines that we believe. You know, that's the person. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God and you want to receive Christ and God the Father, that's the person that you ought to go and say, hey, I want to spend some time with that person. You know, I want to encourage them. I want to motivate them. I want them to know that I, can't, that I, I love and care for them. You know, that's the teaching that we have of Christ. You receive the little ones, you receive Christ and God the Father. That's what makes you great in the kingdom of God. Verse 49. And by the way, just a quick challenge there. You know, I would strongly encourage you, you know, to think about our church. And you know, we don't have that many people. We're not, we're not a big church, okay? And I just want you to think about, you know, just, you know, the last few weeks at church. I'm not saying anybody in particular here. I don't know. I'm just saying, because, you know, as I thought about this, I was challenging myself a little bit, but... Think about the people that you've spoken with. Think about the people you've spent time with, you know. And then think about those that you've not spoken to, that you've not spent any time with, you know. That you've not shown that you actually really do love and care for them and are interested in what they have to say. And I, I would strongly encourage you, if you think about this, you don't need to tell me, you can just work it out yourself. You know, just who in the last few weeks, who in the last month have I not spoken with? Who have I not spent any time with, you know. That's the person that you should receive in Jesus' name. That's the person that you should go up to and encourage and, and tell them that you love them, you care for them, you're praying for them. If there's anything you can do to help them, you know, offer that kind of service. By doing that in the name of Jesus Christ, you're receiving Christ, receiving God the Father, and great will be your rewards in heaven. You'll be counted one of the greatest. You know, we can do that. You know, you might say, oh, I wish I was there when Jesus Christ walked the earth. Yeah, you can receive a little child. That's what you can do, you know, and be great in the kingdom of God. Uh, verse number 49 Verse number 49. Verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. We're seeing, again, remember, Luke is a thematic book. We're just seeing the failings here. <laughs> How bad the disciples fail. Okay? They were lacking faith. They couldn't cast out that devil. You know, Peter was so awestruck by the transfiguration of Christ. You know, he's like, let's build tabernacles for everyone. You know, and we see that uh, now, you know, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And, and Jesus Christ rebukes them and corrects them, right? 
And now they're, they're saying, look, we, for, we, we stopped someone, we forbade someone that was casting out devils in your name. Because why? Because he followeth not with us. You know? And we need to be careful of this. Because these were good men. These were great men. You know, we're made of the same flesh and blood. We can fall in the same trap. We can think of ourselves greater than what we really are. You know? And we can see other believers, other children of God do great works and forbid them. We can say, ah, yeah, but you're not doing it just quite like us. And I want you to notice, what do they focus on? Are they focused at these casting out devils, that these, these people are casting out devils? They're doing good works, that they're proclaiming the name of Christ? Is that what they're concerned about? No. It's like they look beyond that and say, well, they're not following us, so we forbid them. We, we try to stop them. Okay? And what does Jesus focus on? Verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. So we see that John, his focus is on, you know, um, are they just like us? Are they following after us? Are they aligned perfectly with us? That's what he's focused on, right? He's trying to find the, 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 uh, sort of something to criticize these people on. Jesus Christ, instead of being focused whether they're 100% with Christ, he's focused, wait a minute, are they against us? Are they against me? Are they against you? No. And if they're not against you, guess what? They're for us. Okay, they're for us. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just, it's interesting how Jesus sees things differently to how man sees it. You know, we might have brethren in another church that, you know, is King James only, you know, uh, soul winning, believe the gospel and all these kinds of things. But then they might have differences of opinion to us on certain doctrines. They might run church a little differently to us. And it's easy for us to become critical of other believers. And you know, they might have different views on, on, the, on the doctrine of reprobates or something, right? It's easy to criticize others, you know? But Jesus says, look, is he against us? Is he against us? No, he's doing works of God. Then don't forbid him. Don't discourage him. Don't stop him. Allow him to do the works of God then, okay? He doesn't have to be just like us. He doesn't necessarily have to be following me all the way. He's definitely one of us. He's definitely one of me because he's able to do these great works. So we see the, the, what Jesus focuses on, okay? And we need to accept this because we can get hard-headed sometimes and think, well, we're doing it the right way. You know, it's, it's us. It's just us holding the gospel light in Australia. No, there are other churches, believe it or not. There are other churches, there are other believers that love the Lord, that love the gospel. You know, they might not do it as often as we do, but they're doing what they can. They're not against us. They're not against Jesus Christ, okay? And if they're not against Jesus Christ, they're for us, okay? And notice, it's not for you, necessarily. You might say, no, they don't like me. You know, Pastor Kevin, that, that other believer over there, they don't like me. Who cares? Are, th are they for Jesus Christ? That's what matters. Are they for the disciples, the apostles, the writings that we have in scriptures? You know? And, uh, you know, my thoughts on this, if you guys want to just turn too quickly to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. My thoughts are, are this, okay? 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. And again, we've covered this as we went through the book of Corinthians before. This is my thought here. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. Paul warns the church here of others, okay? He says, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Okay? This is where I would draw the line with, with other so-called brethren, so-called Christians. Look, if they have the right Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. Okay? So that's good. Yeah, they got that. All right. Do they have the right spirit? This is why I don't want to associate with the Pentecostals, with the Charismatics. They have another spirit. They have a spirit very similar to that boy that was, that was frothing at the mouth. Okay, they couldn't control his actions. That's another spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit that gives us the boldness to preach the Word of God. Okay? Or another gospel. Another gospel. Again, I don't want to be associated with churches that believe in another gospel. This is number one for me. This is eternal life. This is, this is the doctrine that matters the most, is the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith without the deeds of the law, right? So if there are other believers, guys, that have the same Jesus, that have the same gospel, that have the same spirit, that's the one that is for us. That's the one that's for Jesus Christ. 
okay? They might be a bit lackluster in other things, okay? But I'm not going to forbid them. I'm not going to discourage them. I'm going to try to encourage them. Great, the works of God that you're doing, fantastic, keep it up. At the end of the day, I'm not going to be their judge. They're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and Christ will reward them you know, adequately, you know, righteously and correctly. You know, that's what matters at the end of the day. You don't need to uh, you know, decide what kind of rewards they're going to earn in heaven. That's up to Jesus Christ. Okay? So be mindful. Otherwise, we can become a church or Christians that are far too sectarian. And it's like, well, you've got to be just like us on these things. Otherwise, I don't want fellowship with you. It's crazy. It's not how Jesus Christ was. Okay? Verse 51. Verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So I, I don't really fully understand this, but it seems like there comes a time when Jesus says, all right, now it's time for me to head to Jerusalem. Now it's time for me to go and face this uh, great work that I need to do, this, this uh, crucifixion. Verse number 52. And sent messengers, be messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. So you see, it's not just the Jews that he's focused on. You know, he's making his way, he goes to a village of Samaritans, send messengers so they would know that Jesus Christ would come in. Unfortunately, in verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So, you know, when the Samaritans heard that, well, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, obviously Jerusalem is where the temple of God was. That's where the Jews would worship. And if you remember the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, remember what she says to Jesus? She says, like, you worship, you know, the Jews worship God in the temple, but we worship him in the mountains, if you remember that story, okay? So it's like, to the, it's like nah, we're not going to receive Jesus because you're going to Jerusalem. That's not where you should worship God. Anyway, uh, verse number 53. Uh, sorry, verse number 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, another failure of his disciples here. <laughs> and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou... That sorry, wilt thou, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? So they get offended. James and John says, "Look, can you give us the power to just you know bring down fire from heaven and destroy these Samaritans?" <laughs> uh, verse fifty-five, and and Jesus turned and he turned and rebuked them and said, "Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them." And they went to another village. You know what that tells me? If he doesn't want to destroy them, and he says, look, I, I'm, I'm here to save lives, is that these people are probably going to get other opportunities in the future to hear the gospel and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And again, as soul winners, we don't get received at the door. You know, we already learned. Let's move on. You move on to the next person. You know, shake the dust off your feet. Move on. You know? Don't curse them out. You know? Don't, you know... Command fire out of your mouth, as it were. Hell fire out of your mouth. And destroy those people. They might have a future opportunity to hear the gospel. All right? That's the lesson for us. And look, you might say, oh, these disciples are crazy. We can fall into these same traps. All right? Verse number 57. And it came to pass as they went in the way. A certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, discipleship here. Discipleship. During this ministry of Christ, okay, short period of time, three years, Jesus Christ, if you're going to be the disciple for him, follow after his footsteps, you were to forsake all things, okay? When it comes truly, when it comes to the work of God, when it comes to the gospel, it, it outweighs everything else that could possibly be, okay? It outweighs everything else. Now, again, I don't want to cover, go into this for too long, but just keep your finger there. Turn to Matthew chapter 8 for a minute. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Because I just don't have the time to cover this in any great detail. But I want to show you something about the book of Luke. And something that I'm really appreciating. I've, I've known this when he started the book of Luke. But I'm really appreciating it as we go through this chapter by chapter. Because 
Do you remember what I preached about last week in Luke chapter 8? Remember the story of the, uh, when Jesus Christ fell asleep on the ship and the storms came and he, he stopped, you know, the, the disciples panicked and he stopped the storms. Well, that was Luke chapter 8, okay? And then in Luke chapter 9, we have this discussion, you know, with, with these men seeking that, that are wanting to follow after Christ. But look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And he said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. So you notice that it's the same conversation that we saw in Luke chapter 9, right? Yeah, everyone can see that? But then look at verse 24, verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So what do we see there? In the book of Matthew, we have this conversation with the disciples about following him, all that, before he enters into the ship and the, you know, the storms and he has calms the seas. But in, in the book of Luke, we have that story of the seas before he has this conversation with the disciples. And I've told you this before, that as you read through the Gospels, you know, Matthew, uh, Mark, and John are in chronological order. Okay, if you wanted to build a chronology, do it from these Gospels. And then take the book of Luke and fill in the gaps, that, the, the extra uh, stuff that's in the book of Luke. And the reason I believe he does this, again, is because the book of Luke is thematic, it's topical. And you say, well, why, why, are they, why is this conversation recorded now? And the reason I, I, I believe it's recorded now in the book of Luke is because we just saw what happened to Christ, that he went into that town of the Samaritans and they would not receive him. Okay? And then it, it takes you back to that conversation when Jesus says, hey, look, you follow after me, I don't have a place to rest my head. And truly he didn't because he would go into places and they would not receive him. He would need to then travel onto the next village you know, and not have a place of rest. So you know, i just tell you that just so as you read for the book of Luke, you know, don't be too preoccupied on the chronology. Think about the entire chapter. Think about the entire stories that have been taking place there. Because a lot of those things are tied together by Luke in an order to get a, a, a sort of a fuller picture, a topical picture of the teachings of Christ. All right, let's leave it there. Let's pray.